Welcome. Welcome to this uh, seminar by in Future and Low Energy Electronics and Technology and uh, hosted by Manas University and Materials Australia, uh, the Victorian and Tasmanian branch. We hope uh, wherever you're from that you will enjoy this uh, marvellous seminar. Uh, it will be given by um, Dr. Julie Carroll, and it will be on towards efficient spin, efficient spin uh, current generation using amorphous materials. Uh, before we get into the seminar, though, I would like to uh, acknowledge country. I'm just having a tiny little bit of trouble. Bear with me one second. So uh, as we gather virtually from all the areas of South Central Victoria and the state, we acknowledge the people of the Eastern and Western Kulin nations. In this time when our willem, which means camp or meeting place, is dispersed across many separate homes, we hope that you feel a strong sense of nuga, which means belonging, in meeting with your colleagues, friends and family using alternative and accessible communication methods. Where lands we're conducting our business on remain unceded. With respect to the acknowledge the first nation peoples of the five Kulin nations, the ancestors, elders, past, present, and emerging. So I believe Julie is going to uh, introduce herself, uh, but let me just say uh, she is a very emerging researcher. She is a CI uh, of Fleet and we look forward very much, uh, Julie, to hearing your presentation today. Thank you um, very much, Ivan, for the introduction, and I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk a little bit about my work. Um, before I start, just one little bit of housekeeping. So if you have questions, please just put them in the Q&A section on Zoom, and I'll, I'll answer them then at the end of, at the, end of the talk. Um, so I realize that there are some folks joining from Materials Australia that may not know me, um, and so I just wanted to give a little bit of an introduction um, to myself. So you can probably tell from my accent that um, I'm not from Australia. Um, I'm American and I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, which has actually recently been in the news for sort of not great reasons. Um, I did my bachelor's degree in material science and engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And then after that, I worked as a materials engineer for two years for Intel Corporation, um, both in Phoenix, Arizona and Santa Clara, California. And then after that, um, I evidently am a person who um, likes to do things which are painful. And so I decided to go back into academia and to um, get my master's and then my PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, so I did that and then I moved to a postdoc position at, in Dresden, Germany at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Physics of Solids. And then after that, um, I, I came, I was there for about four years and um, since then I came to Monash and um, took up my position here and I've been here sort of about three and a half years. Um, so I wanted to start my talk today with a quote from Mike Coey from this paper here um, in 2014. And, and those of you that are um, working in the field of magnetism or spintronics know who Mike Coey is. And what he says in this paper is that more um, data is recorded digitally each year than was recorded in all prior human history. And I think this is kind of a, um, a amazing statement. Um, if you think about all the data that was recorded in say 2018 and 2019, and then to think that we're gonna record even more data this year, um, then all of that combined is, is quite impressive. But of course that comes at a cost. 
And it's been predicted that by 2030, data centers alone could represent as much as 13% of total global electricity. And that translates to about sort of 6% of um, global CO2 emissions. So while we're happy that um, and grateful that we can um, watch Netflix, especially this year, as we've been sort of stuck at home for um, large portions of the year, um, we really need to identify low energy electronics and data storage technologies moving forward. And that's, um, that's really what Fleet is, is trying to do. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking a little bit more specifically about um, non-volatile memory and, and data storage. So this is the outline for my talk. Um, as I mentioned, I'm first going to introduce some non-volatile memory um, technologies, kind of what we're currently using and, and what our proposed um, kind of future solutions. And what I'm ultimately going to show is that um, regardless of, of these different technologies that are kind of proposed um, future solutions, they require uh, efficient spin current generation or spin orbit torques. And so I'll talk a little bit then about methods for spin current generation. And then um, in the second half of my talk, I'm going to talk about my own work in using amorphous materials to um, generate spin currents. And um, I'm going to show you that there'll be, um, the, there are some advantages and opportunities there. So let's start um, by getting into um, talking about non-volatile memory. So when I, when I say non-volatile memory, I'm talking about memory which, um, which is retained even when, when, the, um, when the device is powered off. And all of you that are listening to me right now are sitting in front of some type of non-volatile memory, um, whether that be a hard disk drive or a solid state drive, which is compo uh, composed primarily of flash. And so there are advantages and disadvantages to, to each of these technologies. Hard disk drives are um, pretty cheap, but they're relatively slow. And um, solid state drives are, are much faster, um, but they tend to have low endurance. So there's only a certain number of times where you can write a piece of data before you start having errors propagating through the system. And so um, we in the, in the sort of Spintronics community and in the magnetism community have been working on um, alternatives which can address some of these issues as well as, as the energy efficiency um, needs that, that we have. And so I just wanna talk about a, a couple of, of those technologies very briefly. And so the first one um, is something called magnetoresistive random access memory. It's typically called MRAM. And um, the way that this device works, is sort of the, the fundamental memory element is a magnetic tunnel junction. And, and, and that's what stores sort of your bit of data. So let me explain a little bit about um, how this operates. So you have two ferromagnetic layers and they're separated by um, an oxide layer, typically MgO. And one of these ferromagnetic layers is the, the orientation of the magnetic moment is pinned in a, in a specific direction. So you can see that here in red. And then the other layer, um, the orientation of the magnetic moment is, is free to rotate. And so the device itself, if we um, if we're to pass a current across the device, if the orientation of, of the two magnetic layers is parallel, the resistance of the device will be low. And that's kind of our zero state in, in, in our memory. Um, now we can switch the orientation of the magnetization in that free layer. And, and then if we pass a current through, through our junction, um, the resistance will be high and that can be our one state. So each one of these um, can store sort of a bit of data and MRAM is, a, is a, an array of these junctions, each one of which is individually addressable. So the, the key in terms of um, making this work and not um, and, and making it work with low energy consumption is to switch this free layer um, with as little energy as possible. And it turns out that the sort of best way that we know how to do that is using something called a spin orbit torque. Um, and I'm going to talk about this um, in much more detail coming up here. Um, but essentially, if you were to um, to have a non-magnetic layer um, adjacent to your free magnetic layer, you can pass a current through that layer and um, generate a spin current. And that spin current can exhibit a torque which can flip this free magnetic layer. And as I said, I'll, I'll talk more about that in detail. But first I wanna talk about the other um, memory technology that, that um, folks are working on. And that is racetrack memory. 
Um, and so this was originally developed, um, originally proposed using magnetic domain walls, and it's since kind of um, moved on to using or utilizing skirmions. And so I'll first talk about the domain walls, and then I'll talk about the skirmions. And so the idea is that you have a ferromagnetic nanowire, and you can either have it in the vertical orientation, as I'm showing here, or in the horizontal orientation. And here, your, your bit or of data is stored in the magnetic domain wall. So a domain wall is um, where essentially where two um, magnetic domains meet. So a magnetic domain contains um, magnetic moments that are all pointing in, in the same direction. So here, for instance, in the red, you can imagine all of the, the magnetic moments are pointing left. And here in the blue, all of the magnetic moments are pointing to the right. And where they meet, you have this domain wall. And that, and then that can be your, um, that can store information. And so we can, we can move these domain walls through the device um, with a current, as I'm showing in this little sort of cartoon here. And, um, and so we can address each one of these domain walls and we can read it using a magnetic tunnel junction similar to, to what I described in the previous slide. And we can write these domain walls um, by applying a current basically perpendicular to the domain wall and, and you can generate an Ersted field. And there are some other um, ways you can do it, but, but that's kind of an example. So um, this, this field um, really sort of, I would say, got pushed forward um, with the discovery of skirmions. And so skirmions are um, non-collinear magnetic structures. I'm showing just an example of, of one of them here. And so you can see the um, magnetization is pointing down in the, in the center of the skirmion, and then, and then it rotates. Um, and so at the edge of the skirmion, the magnetization is, is pointing up. And so you can think of this like a magnetic quasi-particle and this is kind of a, a cartoon schematic of a, of a racetrack. And so, um, you know, if you have a skirmy on there, that could be a one state, whereas if you don't have a skirmy on, that could be a zero. And, and um, these can be moved in the, in the same way that you can move domain walls. Um, and they could be read um, using a um, MTJ, a magnetic tunnel junction. And, and there's a variety of ways that you can, that you can write them applied fields, um, applied magnetic fields, applied electric fields, and also thermally in some cases. And so um, the, the kind of the, one of the, the key things here is that it turns out also the easiest way to move them is to use a spin orbit torque. And you can, you can drive skirmions or domain walls using spin orbit torques, and it's been shown that they can reach velocities that are greater than a kilometer per second. And I think that's, that's quite impressive. And so um, in, in sort of both of, of, of these emerging non-volatile memory technologies, despite the fact that they operate completely differently, um, spin orbit torques are, are important in the generation of spin currents. And so now I want to um, talk a little bit about um, in more detail about what I mean and, and how we can how we can generate spin currents. So um, when I'm talking about a spin orbit torque, I'm talking about a transfer of angular momentum from the orbitals to the spins. And this is mediated by conduction electrons and, and spin orbit coupling. And so the reservoir typically of orbital angular momentum is a, um, for instance, a heavy metal. And so you can see in, in, this, in this image here, um, we pass a current through the heavy metal that is the, the white arrow here. And that generates a spin current that's perpendicular to the, to the charge current. So you have an accumulation of one type of spin at the bottom of this layer and an accumulation of the other um, orientation of spin at the, at the top of the layer. Now these spins here can um, diffuse into this adjacent ferromagnetic layer and they can, they can exhibit a torque or a pull on, on the magnetic moments in that ferromagnetic layer and they can cause those moments to, to oscillate or to, um, to, to change in, in direction. And so um, you can imagine that if, if we were to put, um, if this were, if this were to be our magnetic tunnel junction, we could put a heavy metal layer next to our ferromagnetic free layer, and we could use this type of methodology to flip the magnetization in the free layer. Or similarly, we could put a heavy metal um, adjacent to our, to our magnetic nanowire, and we could use that to drive skirmion motion or, or, or domain wall motion. And so um, this is a, this is a, a 
a charge to spin current conversion. So we are applying a charge current and we're converting it to a spin current and then we're using that to, to um, switch a, a ferromagnetic moment. So it's, um, this is different. I, I, for folks that are, that are sort of working in, in um, this area, this is different than spin transfer torque, which is um, a transfer of spin angular momentum between two ferromagnets that have non-collinear um, magnetization. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about how this process occurs and what gives us this charge to spin current conversion. So um, I've been talking ab about a heavy metal or a, or a non-magnetic material. So let's start there. Um, it turns out you can also do this with ferromagnets and I'll get to that in a minute. So again, um, this is our device structure. This is a slightly different picture, um, but we have, we have our heavy metal layer here. We're applying a charge current. It's generating a perpendicular spin current and, and the spins um, in that spin current are oriented perpendicular to both the charge and the spin current. Um, so what are the mechanisms that, that can generate this spin current? The first one is something um, which is a bulk effect and it's called the spin hall effect. So this occurs in sort of the bulk of the, of the heavy metal layer. And it, um, it, it can, there, there's a couple different origins for it. Um, some of them are extrinsic. So um, scattering, different types of scattering from impurities with spin orbit coupling. And then there is a, an intrinsic term which is related to the electronic structure of the material itself. And in particular, the, the topology and the electronic structure. So uh, non-zero Berry curvature. And I'll talk more about what, um, what I mean by that in a little bit later in the talk. But this is, um, this is a bulk effect and it, it comes from the, from the heavy metal layer. Now we can also have an interface effect, um, something called the Rashba Edelstein effect. And so this occurs at the interface between the heavy metal and the ferromagnet. And the electrons that are traveling at that interface due to the fact that um, inversion symmetry is broken at that interface will experience a relativistic magnetic field. And that can lead to a, a spin current being generated as well. And then finally, um, you, you can also um, generate a spin current from a charge current in topological insulators due to spin momentum locking. And so topological insulators have some very um, unique properties in their electronic structure and, and some topology in their electronic structure. And um, one of those properties is that the spin, the orientation of the spins is basically fixed to, to the momentum. And so if you have a, a charge current um, traveling in a specific direction, the spins will have the same orientation. You can use that to generate a spin current. Um, so you can also use ferromagnetic materials to generate spin currents, and that can be done through the anomalous Hall effect. And so this is an effect um, where you can apply a, a current in a, in a material in a perpendicular magnetic field, and you can generate a transverse charge current and concomitant spin current. And so um, this, this device structure is slightly different than, than the non-magnetic one here, um, but, but, the, but the idea is kind of the same. Um, so you have a charge current here and you have a perpendicular spin current that's generated. And so the, the difference here, which can be quite an advantage is that in the non-magnetic system, the spins are always gonna be, um, because of the symmetry of the system, the spins are gonna be perpendicular to both the charge and the spin current. Whereas here, the spins are oriented along the direction of the magnetization of the ferromagnetic layer. And, and that can be easily changed just by changing the orientation of the ferromagnetism in, in the, or the orientation of the magnetism in the, in the ferromagnetic layer. Um, and so that can, that can allow you a little more flexibility in, 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 um, in changing the, the um, orientation of the magnetism in the, in the free magnetic layer. Okay, so um, when, we, when we start thinking about charge to spin current conversion, we've got um, a couple different kind of options of, of ways that, that we can do this. And um, we've developed or um, we use a sort of a figure of merit to um, compare which materials um, perform better. And, and that figure of merit is, is a, um, 
sometimes called the spin orbit torque efficiency. Um, it, you may see it referred to in the literature as an anomalous, or sorry, a spin hall angle. Um, that kind of doesn't account for these other mechanisms. So I think folks are kind of moving towards calling a spin orbit torque efficiency. Um, when you're talking about ferromagnets, it's sometimes called an anomalous hall angle. And, and you'll hear me refer to it in this talk as an anomalous hall angle. Um, but, but it's the same kind of general idea. It's the ratio of the spin current to the charge current. And so um, for, you know, for whatever charge current we put in, what's the spin current that we get out? And when we're thinking about efficiency of devices and, and lowering energy consumption, this is, this is where we can win. And this is why spin orbit torques um, can be really beneficial because this, um, this value can be greater than one, which means that um, we can get out a greater spin current um, than the charge current that we put in. And so that's why folks are, are really interested in, in, in using spin orbit torques for um, some of these different uh, non-volatile memory applications. Okay, so I want to make sort of a, a parenthetical comment, um, which will bring me to my next point. So I've talked um, specifically about where, where we can use spin orbit torques and, and spin currents um, that are generated in, in non-volatile memory, but that's not really the only place that they're applicable. And so um, there, there's been some proposals um, where they can be used in, in logic devices. And so this is an example of a, a proposed logic device from some folks at Intel a couple years back. And um, they, the, the kind of the details of the device are not important, um, but what they're proposing is either using a multiferroic material or a magnetoelectric ferromagnetic material. Um, and, and, and you need to be able to read out the spin state of that ferromagnetic material using a spin current. Um, there's also kind of more general proposals um, and, and folks have been working on spin logic. Um, the idea with, with spin logic is that instead of using sort of pools of electronic charge to, um, to perform computational um, operations, you instead use spins or specifically uh, skirmions or, or domain walls. And so you need to be able to move these skirmions or domain walls around in your device and, and you can use spin orbit torques to do that. Um, additionally, there has been work in spin torque nano oscillators. And so um, this is a device which has a structure which is sort of similar to the magnetic tunnel junction that we talked about. So you have a fixed magnetic layer and you have a free magnetic layer. In this case, they're separated by a metal instead of um, an insulating layer. And you can use a spin orbit torque to get that free magnetic layer to oscillate. So we know that um, the resistance of the device will change when the orientation be of the magnetic moments between the free layer and the, and the fixed layer changes. And so um, when this magnetization oscillates like that, um, the, the, voltage, the resistance or the voltage will change. And so in this case, we have basically an oscillating magnetic and electric field. We can use this to generate RF um, signals in the in the gigahertz and the terahertz range, and that's applicable for for wireless applications. And um, something which has emerged more recently using spin torque nano oscillators is in the area of neuromorphic computing. And um, so, so these spin torque nano oscillators are, are nonlinear oscillators and they can be coupled. So you can make an array of them that, that can couple together. It turns out that um, the neurons in our brain also behave like nonlinear coupled oscillators. And so there was some work um, that was done a couple of years ago in this paper here where they showed that they could use a coupled array of spin torque nano oscillators to um, perform uh, speech recognition and it was done as well as um, kind of state-of-the-art neural networks. And um, so I think that's another really exciting area. So that was sort of a, a long parenthetical comment, but um, the point is that it's not just in non-volatile memory where, where spin orbit torques and, and spin currents can be useful. There are a lot of other applications um, in, in logic and computing. And, and I think because of that, there has been a lot of investigations into different materials that, um, that can generate spin currents. And so I think some of the, the kind of the earlier work was in, was in heavy metals um, and that's since been, been kind of branched out. So um, there's been work done using topological insulators. More recently, some really interesting work on antiferromagnets with um, specific symmetries in the, in the crystal structure.
some work last year using oxides, strontium ruthenate and strontium iridate and, and ferromagnets as well. And um, there's still some challenges, of course. Um, there's, no, there's no one sort of obvious um, material which performs better than all of them. The biggest challenge, of course, is, is increasing the efficiency. But even in some of the materials which I've shown to have um, quite high efficiencies, there are still um, things to sort out. So sometimes they end up having high resistivity and they're therefore not compatible with low voltage devices. Um, some of these kind of novel materials are, are not CMOS compatible. They may be air sensitive or, or they may be expensive. Of. And so um, another thing that you'll notice here is that all of these materials are by March that have been studied are crystalline. And um, so what I would like to talk about now for sort of the, the second half of my talk is my work using amorphous materials um, to generate spin currents. And I'll show you um, that I think there are some, some opportunities and advantages here. Um, as I mentioned, there's a couple different kind of classes of materials that you can use to generate spin currents, ferromagnets and non-magnets. And I'm gonna kind of further break down this part of my talk and talk about both of those separately. And so first we'll start off by talking about, about the ferromagnets. So, um, Amorphous materials haven't been um, extensively studied for this application, and so you may ask, well, why, why do you want to study these? Why, you know, what's, what's the point of using an amorphous material here? And um, I think there are some advantages. Of course, they're um, tolerant to defects because um, they're completely disordered. They can also be quite low cost. So, um, I'm going to be talking about um, a lot about iron silicon. Iron and silicon are two of the most abundant elements on Earth, um, and so they they can be quite low cost in in comparison to um, some of the other materials that have been proposed. In addition, I'm um, going to be talking about silicides primarily, and a little bit about germanides, and um, those are certainly CMOS compatible. So silicides, transition metal silicides, have been used in the semiconductor industry um, for many years as um, a local interconnects, gate electrodes and as diffusion barriers. Um, so that's kind of the, the motivation from sort of a, a, an engineering standpoint, but I'm also interested in the physics. And um, a couple of these different mechanisms by which you can generate a spin current, such as the spin Hall effect, the anomalous Hall effect, and topological insulators rely on um, uh, topology in the electronic structure or some specific kind of properties in the electronic structure, and namely a non-zero Berry curvature. And that has been typically thought to exist only in crystalline materials. And there's been some um, theoretical predictions recently suggesting that maybe that topology can be preserved even when you make the material completely disordered. And so there is a proposal for topological amorphous metals and, and topological insulators um, in amorphous systems. And so I've I was intrigued by, by these um, theoretical predictions and I wanted to see in, in my materials if I could experimentally realize some of this topology and, and if, if then um, these, these materials might then be applicable to generate spin currents. So um, this is work that's done as a collaboration with Francis Hellman's group at UC Berkeley. And um, what we did is we grew a series of amorphous um, transition metal silicides and germanides um, thin films using electron beam co-evaporation. And so you can see here the different um, systems that we looked at, iron silicon, iron germanium, iron cobalt silicon, cobalt silicon, and cobalt germanium. And we varied the transition metal content in each of those systems. The films were grown at room temperature on amorphous silicon nitride on silicon substrates. And um, I've worked on these systems or sort of a subset of these systems for kind of the better part of 10 years. And um, Francis has for even, even longer than that. So we have a pretty good sense of how the materials behave. I'm gonna be talking today primarily about the electronic and the magnetotransport data, and, and we'll mention a little bit the squid magnetometry, but we understand quite well um, how the spin polarization behaves and, and what sort of um, the electronic structure is doing in these materials because we've done hard X-ray photo emission 
spectroscopy and also some synchrotron based x-ray absorption techniques and we um, we know sort of what the magnetic environment looks like in in these systems because we've done conversion electron mass bar spectrometry as well so um, I'm not going to talk about all of these characterization techniques today but um, but we, we have a pretty good understanding of what's going on in these systems. And of course, we've done sort of the requisite uh, transmission electron microscopy experiments to verify that our films are in fact um, completely disordered and, and that we don't have any uh, nanocrystallinity in, in the system. Okay, so um, I'm going to introduce some of um, the experiments that we did, which will eventually then lead um, to to the anomalous Hall effect work, and um, I'll, I'll then I'll need some of the kind of preliminary data to be able to explain our our anomalous Hall effect results. So I'm going to start by talking about the electronic transport. And so I'm showing here resistivity as a function of temperature for a series of amorphous iron silicon or iron cobalt silicon thin films. And what you can see is that there's very little sort of temperature dependence to the resistivity. And this is common in amorphous materials, and this is consistent with what we saw in all of the systems that we investigated. And the reason for that is basically because um, the the mean free path is sort of on the order of an interatomic spacing and so it just really doesn't change much with temperature like like it would in in a typical crystalline metal and so what's changing here um, as we as we change the composition is just the number of charge carriers and so you can see um, this is a plot now of conductivity versus transition metal content we add um, we increase the transition metal content and, and the conductivity goes up because the number of char charge carriers goes up. So um, that's perhaps not shocking and, it, and it's consistent across sort of all of the um, all of the, the different material systems that we looked at. I should also make a comment here um, that the these conductivities are, of course, lower than um, what you would find in a, in a typical crystalline metal. Um, so let's move on then and look at the magnetization. I'm showing here saturation magnetization as a function of transition metal. And um, what you see is sort of, um, I would say two separate um, kind of trends. Uh, these lines are just a guide to the eye and you can see that most of the iron rich systems fall kind of along um, this line, whereas the, the cobalt systems um, are here. And it looks like the magnetization is turning on at sort of maybe about 60% um, cobalt Whereas in the in the iron containing systems, they're ferromagnetic at low temperature, even as low as about 45% iron. And so um, this can be understood in, in terms of a simple kind of interaction based model proposed by Jacarino and Walker. And um, what that model says is that there's a, a minimum number of transition metal nearest neighbors required before you can observe appreciable ferromagnetism in the system. And it turns out that that minimum number is greater in cobalt-based systems than it is in iron-based systems. And so that's why um, the, the ferromagnetism sort of turns on a little bit later than it does in the iron-based systems. And actually the iron-based systems turn on around, around about 40%, which is over here somewhere. So that's why um, even in these, in these samples at 45%, we see ferromagnetism. Now I should note that for the iron-based systems, all of the samples that we looked at are ferromagnetic at low temperatures. And then of course for cobalt, um, they're ferromagnetic um, greater than 60% at low temperatures. And in, in the case of the iron-based systems, greater than 55%, the samples are ferromagnetic at room temperature. Um, now there's another kind of intriguing point, which um, is not sort of obvious on, on this curve here, but we've compared in the iron-silicon system the magnetization between uh, crystalline and amorphous. And what we found is that the magnetization in the amorphous systems is significantly enhanced. And so you can see here um, now the amorphous systems are in red. These are uh, theory and this is experimental data points. And similarly here, this is crystalline um, experimental and theory data points. And um, the reason for this is that we um, we did some X-ray absorption fine structure studies to look at the local atomic environments in in our amorphous systems, and we found that there's a reduction in the number of iron silicon first nearest neighbor pairs, and that leads to reduced PD hybridization, and that's why we get this enhanced moment in these systems. Okay, so let's turn now to the anomalous Hall effect results. Um, <clears throat> 
this is just kind of a, a little schematic of, of the experiment in case um, folks forgot. So we have a, a slab of material. This is our amorphous thin film. We're passing a current in, in the direction of this blue arrow. Um, we're applying a perpendicular magnetic field here in, in the direction of this yellow arrow. And then we're measuring a, a transverse voltage. And so um, the data that we obtain looks something like the left curve. This is a Hall resistivity as a function of applied magnetic field for a particular iron cobalt silicon amorphous sample, amorphous thin film. And um, we've looked at a couple different temperatures. You can see it still has an appreciable Hall resistivity at room temperature. And um, these, these data are characteristic of, of what we observed for, for all of the samples. Um, so I'm showing on the, on the right hand side, Hall resistivity as a function of transition metal for, for the different systems that, that we looked at in this work. And these are, these are low temperature values. And what you can see is that the data is sort of reminiscent of what we saw in the magnetization. And that's, that's not surprising. Um, the, the Hall conductivity or Hall resistivity tends to scale with the magnetization. So we see um, the iron, iron rich samples kind of uh, fall on, on one curve and the cobalt samples um, don't really start having an appreciable hall resistivity until about 60% or greater than 60% transition metal. So um, it, it, this, I mean, for folks that are probably not working directly in the area, this may not be obvious, but um, some of these hall resistivities are actually quite high. Um, and in fact, when we compare that with um, crystalline systems, so this is an example in iron silicon um, where we've looked at um, amorphous um, iron silicon with 71% iron, and we've looked at uh, crystalline iron silicon with 71% iron, we can see that there's a very large enhancement in the hull resistivity. And so in order to be able to sort of um, understand what's going on in the system and, and, and talk about what might be driving this, I need to talk a little bit about the theory. So um, sort of bear with me for the next couple slides while, while I briefly discuss the theory here. So if we... Um, if we first, if we just consider the Hall effect in a non-magnetic material, um, again we have this slab of material. We we have a charge current, um, perpendicular magnetic field, and we're going to measure a transverse voltage, and that's just due to the Lorentz force acting on the charge carriers. Now, if this material is ferromagnetic, we're going to observe an additional contribution to that voltage, um, sometimes called the anomalous. Um, contribution or the anomalous voltage and and that's um, that's the so-called anomalous Hall effect and that can have a couple different origins. The, a couple of them are sort of extrinsic origins, um, different types of scattering mechanisms from impurities with spin orbit coupling and then there is also this this intrinsic origin which is related to the electronic structure in the ferromagnetic material and more specifically a, a non-zero Berry curvature. And so this is a consequence of spin orbit coupling, which um, can open a gap at band anti-crossing points in the electronic structure. And if the Fermi energy lies near that gap, you'll observe an enhancement in the Hall conductivity. And so the point here is that this is really um, this is an intrinsic effect due to the electronic structure in the material. Okay, so we have these three different contributions and how can we um, then separate them out or decide what might be dominant in, in the particular material system that we're studying? Well, there's been a unified scaling theory that's been developed for ferromagnets. And um, the theory suggests the following. It suggests plotting sigma xy, which is the Hall conductivity. So it's given here um, as, as the Hall resistivity over the longitudinal resistivity squared. So you plot that as a function of the longitudinal conductivity. And when you do that, there are sort of three um, different regions that emerge as a function of conductivity. And so um, in the high conductivity range, the theory predicts that sigma xy is roughly proportional to sigma xx and that skew scattering is, is therefore the dominant mechanism in this range. In the kind of middle conductivity range, the theory predicts that sigma xy is, is independent of sigma xx, so it's roughly constant, and the intrinsic mechanism um, dominates in, in this region. And then finally, in the low conductivity range, um, it's been found empirically that sigma xy is roughly proportional to sigma xx to the 1.6 to 1.8, um, but there's not a lot of theory to, to explain what might be going on there. 
So typically what happens is experimentalists can kind of map their data onto this framework and try to say something about what might be happening in their system. And so I've done this um, for the samples that we've looked at. And in this case, I'm um, actually normalizing sigma x y by the magnetization because we know that that's changing and that is, is not accounted for in the theory. And I'm also normalizing by the number of charge carriers. And the reason for that is that the theory um, the theory suggests plotting it against sigma xx, but, but really what's changing in the theory is the carrier lifetime. And we know in our system that what's changing is, is actually the number of carriers. So we do that normalization. And what we see is that is um, relatively constant or relatively independent of sigma xx. And that suggests that the intrinsic mechanism is dominant in our amorphous system as well. Now, um, this is a, a little bit surprising because it, it indicates that we might have a non-zero Berry curvature and everything, um, you know, the, the kind of the way that I've described the Berry curvature um, relies on there being a, a band structure in the material. And we know that these amorphous materials, um, K is not a, a, a good quantum number. It's not a, we can't describe a system in that way because there, um, there's no periodicity in the lattice. And so what that indicates is that um, the local structure must be playing an important role. And in fact, there, um, there was a theory paper that came out describing the locality of the anomalous Hall conductivity. And, and the paper says the intrinsic anomalous Hall conductivity is a local property of the electron, electronic ground state. And it can be evaluated in samples where the concept of reciprocal space doesn't make any sense. So um, you might be thinking, okay, well, see, so just on a scaling analysis, and 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 how can you how can you be sure that that you have um, that you have the intrinsic contribution dominating in in your anomalous Hall effect data in your amorphous systems? Um, and so uh, we collaborated with a with a theoretician, Ruchin Wu at UC Irvine, and he's able to make calculations of the intrinsic anomalous Hall conductivity in amorphous materials. And so we looked um, particularly at our amorphous iron germanium materials. And so what he does is he uses molecular dynamics to simulate a, an amorphous structure. So he has 128 atoms in his unit cell. And then he performs TFT on that to calculate the intrinsic anomalous Hall conductivity. And, and he determines that by calculating something called the density of Berry curvature. And, and that, that is, a, um, is a sum of the partial density of states of local orbital states that um, have spin orbit correlations. And so from that density of Berry curvature, you can calculate the intrinsic anomalous Hall conductivity. And so that's what he's done um, for the amorphous iron germanium work. And so you can see these um, sort of turquoise colored triangles here are, are his calculations. And, um, and the, blue, the blue data points are our experimental data. And this is the total Hall conductivity that we measure. And you can see the trend is, is, is very nicely consistent, um, which indicates that the intrinsic mechanism is playing a, a dominant role in our system. Now there is, a, um, there is an offset and we believe that that is due to a um, uh, uh, composition independent psi jump. Um, contribution to to the Hall conductivity because again this is the total Hall conductivity and this is just the intrinsic contribution. So Ruchin has also ca uh, made calculations in just one amorphous iron silicon composition and he finds that the intrinsic Hall conductivity is about 28 inverse ohm centimeters and, and you can compare that with um, with our, some of our experimental total Hall conductivities for sort of similar compositions and they're, and they're quite close and so um, what we um, based on the, on these on these theoretical calculations and based on the on the scaling that we observed experimentally, we think that the intrinsic contribution is dominating in in all of our amorphous systems. Okay, so that's sort of um, the discussion of of the anomalous Hall effect. Um, now I want to come back to talking about um, generation of spin currents and and so since we're talking about ferromagnets and and the anomalous Hall effect, we want to think about um, the anomalous Hall angle, which is a measure of efficiency in generating a, a spin current from a charged current. So first, I'd like to just sort of introduce the anomalous Hall angle in in some uh, crystalline systems, and so. Um, the data from from some of these of crystalline ferromagnetic materials comes from this nature physics paper from a couple of years ago and and um, 
what they're what I'm showing here is the anomalous Hall angle, which is given by the Hall conductivity over the longitudinal conductivity. And that's plotted as a function of the Hall conductivity. And what you can see is that um, as the Hall conductivity de increases, the anomalous Hall angle decreases. And that's um, sort of what we would expect based on the unified scaling theory. So we know that sigma xy and sigma xx are, are correlated and both typically either um, large, either both of them are large or both of them are small. And, and so um, that's consistent then with the behavior that we're observing here. Now, if we make the same plot for our amorphous materials that we studied, we observe a completely different behavior. So again, anomalous Hall angle as a function of Hall conductivity. And we can see that the anomalous Hall angle increases linearly as the Hall conductivity increases. And so um, our data is shown here as the, as the filled in colored data points. And um, some other data from the literature is, is, is the open symbols, but you can see the trend is, is consistent. And so um, we can understand this. Uh, there's kind of a simple explanation um, that we can use to understand this. So we know in our amorphous systems that the longitudinal conductivity is generally quite low. And um, we also know that magnetism and therefore the Hall conductivity are can be robust to disorder and, and they can be they can be large even um, in amorphous systems. And so um, we can basically what we're seeing is that we're seeing an increase in sigma xy where sigma xx is is, is staying relatively low. Um, the anomalous Hall angles that we measured were as large as 5%. And um, if we can go back and sort of compare to our crystalline systems, um, that's not too bad. Um, it's, it's larger than, than some crystalline systems and, and you know, it's kind of in the ballpark of others. Um, what I think is, is probably a more interesting point is the potential that you could increase the anomalous Hall angle further. So um, this trend is sort of going in the right direction. And if we can increase sigma xy further, either potentially by adding um, a rare earth magnetic element or maybe by adding a heavy element um, to tune, tune the electronic structure and maybe the Berry curvature, we might be able to increase sigma xy and, and therefore the anomalous Hall angle. Um, and so the, these results are looking sort of promising um, in terms of generating spin currents. Okay, um, so I've talked um, talked about the ferromagnetic systems and, and in particular the, the anomalous Hall effect um, and, and talking about efficiencies there. Now I want to move on and talk about some measurements we've done where we've actually measured the spin orbit torques that are generated from these amorphous materials. And here I'm going to be talking about non-magnetic amorphous materials. Um, and so this work was done in collaboration with Sayu Salahuddin's group at UC Berkeley. And the measurements that we did are the harmonic hall, are harmonic hall measurements and spin torque ferromagnetic resonance measurements. And these were all conducted at room temperature. The systems that we looked at are amorphous iron silicon um, with these concentrations here, 40% and 45%. And these, um, these materials are, are paramagnetic at room temperature. So, so we're not considering ferromagnetism anymore. And so um, from these measurements, we're able to extract a spin orbit torque efficiency. And so let me um, get first into the harmonic hall measurements. So um, the experiment is performed like this. We have an eight nanometer layer of amorphous iron silicon with um, the compositions that I mentioned. And then we have four nanometers of ferromagnetic cobalt on top of that. It's patterned into a hall bar um, and we, we up we inject a current into the system, we measure a Hall voltage, and um, we are rotating the magnetic field. And so um, when we're injecting a current in, into our heterostructure, some of that current is gonna go through the amorphous iron silicon. It um, is gonna generate a spin current, and that spin current is going to exhibit a torque on the, cobalt, the magnetic moments in the cobalt. And there are a couple different torques um, that were, that were concerned with um, or that we're, that we're interested in. And so I apologize that this figure is, is taken from a, a different paper and it's actually rotated 90 degrees from, from what I have here. So this is our non-magnetic layer. So this is our amorphous iron silicon layer. The charge current is going in this direction in this figure. This is our spin current. 
the, and the spins here. And this red arrow here is um, a magnetic moment in the cobalt layer. And so that magnetic, that magnetic moment in the cobalt layer is going to feel a torque from this spin current. There's actually two torques here. So this um, sort of turquoise one is a damping like torque. Um, and then there's this green one here, which is a field like torque. And we also have a, a torque from the Gilbert damping and, and we're not going to be as concerned about that in, in these experiments. Okay. So if these torques are present, we will observe a quasi-static quasi oscillation of the magnetic moments in the cobalt layer, and we should be able to see that in the harmonic Hall voltages that we measure. And so we measure the first and second harmonic Hall voltages, um, and you can see the data here. So the first harmonic Hall voltage is comprised primarily of the planar Hall effect, and it um, it's probably not so interesting for for um, what we're what we're looking at here. The second harmonic Hall voltage has contributions from both the field-like torque, the damping-like torque, as well as some thermal effects. Um, and so we need to separate all of those out. But luckily, they have different um, dependencies on the magnetic field and on, on the angle um, that the magnetic field is applied. And so we, through some sort of complicated um, or I shouldn't say complicated, complex fitting, we can, we can extract out um, these individual torque contributions. And so we do that. And what I'm showing here now is um, what we're calling an effective field. So this is an effective field from the field like torque, um, which is a bit of a mouthful, but and um, I hope you get the point. And this is an effective field from the damping like torque. And I'm plotting that as a function of the current um, going through the amorphous iron silicon layer. And what you can see is that there's a linear dependence there. And, and that's what we would expect um, if, if these spin orbit torques are present. So the more current that we apply to the amorphous iron silicon layer, um, the, the greater the, the spin current should be generated and the larger the torque um, that's exhibited on those cobalt moment, moments should be. And that's in fact what we observe. So we can extract a spin orbit torque efficiency from, from these data. And, and these are the values that we obtain. And I'll say a little bit more about, um, about those values in a minute, but I just want to talk um, about the second measurement that we did to verify that we had spin orbit torques in our system. And so um, we did spin torque ferromagnetic resonance as well. And so we, we took our heterostructure again, eight nanometers of amorphous iron silicon and, and four nanometers of cobalt and coupled it with a um, planar waveguide. Then we inject um, an RF current in, into the heterostructure and that causes the um, the cobalt moments in the, in the or sorry, the, the moments in the cobalt layer to, to process and creates an oscillating anisotropic magneto resistance. At the same time, we sweep the magnetic field in the plane of, of the film. And at some magnetic field, you're going to fulfill the conditions for ferromagnetic resonance. And you can measure that um, as, as a voltage. It's a, it's a mixing voltage between the oscillating anisotropic magneto resistance and the, um, the, the RF current. Um, the details of that are not so important. I think the point is that we, we have these, um, this ferromagnetic resonance of, of these cobalt magnetic moments and, and that is gonna be affected by spin orbit torques that are generating um, by the spin current that's created um, in the amorphous iron silicon layer and so we can analyze that ferromagnetic resonance and say something about those torques. And so what we do is we fit that signal to a symmetric and an anti-symmetric component. The symmetric component is due to um, the damping-like torque and the anti-symmetric component is due to the field-like torque. And so we, we did that and we can also extract a, a spin orbit torque efficiency um, from these data, you can see these numbers are a little bit different than the ones that I showed you on the previous slide. Um, so let me kind of just put, um, put these efficiencies in context. So I think the first point I want to make is that we observed a spin orbit torque in, um, created from amorphous iron silicon, and that, that's a sort of surprising result. Um, I don't think any, that was something which was, which was expected. And I think um, the really cool thing is that that spin orbit torque efficiency is, is actually kind of reasonable, reasonably large. Um, there's obviously a range in, in efficiencies that we measured, um, depending on the composition of the material and also 
depending on the on the technique and I, I if folks are interested i can talk a little bit about why why there's such a range but even if we compare the low end of the range to to crystalline silicon it's it's 300 times larger in the amorphous system we can also compare it to um, platinum which is a heavy metal and it's kind of the um, sort of gold standard for spin orbit torque efficiencies a lot of folks compare um, their their efficiencies to to what's been found in platinum so platinum is around eight percent and we're kind of um, in the ballpark of, of platinum depending on which um, which of these efficiencies you use we may even be larger and so this is a really surprising result um, because we we observed efficiencies that are kind of you know in the ballpark of platinum in a system that's amorphous and that has no heavy metal element in it um, we're still trying to understand the origin of this large spin orbit torque so the symmetries of the torque that we observe are um, consistent either with a giant spin hall effect or with a Rashba Edelstein effect. Um, and so we're, we're trying to understand um, a little bit more about what might be going on in the system. And Ruchin is, is making some calculations of the spin hall conductivity, which might help give us some information. Um, another intriguing um, result that we found is that we performed similar experiments on amorphous silicon. Um, and we observe basically no spin orbit torque in the system. And so it seems to be that having that transition metal um, is important. And, and, and so we're, we, we need to understand why. And so there's a lot still to be done in this area. But I think the more that we understand about what's generating these large spin orbit torques, um, the more we can think about engineering the materials to get an even higher efficiency. And um, with that, I come to sort of my concluding slide. So um, I've talked a little bit about um, the need for uh, efficient electronic and, and data storage devices and that um, generation of, of spin currents is, is critical to numerous um, both logic and, and data storage devices. And I hope I managed to convince you that amorphous materials um, can, can sort of play ball in this arena. Um, I showed anomalous tall angles that are kind of greater than or equal to crystalline materials and, and some sort of um, spin orbit torque efficiencies that were sort of surprisingly large and, and kind of on, on par with platinum. And, and I guess um, the the point I really want to make is that is not that we can you know make things in amorphous or make amorphous materials that are as good as crystalline materials. It's that I think there's a lot of um, potential to to improve these efficiencies in these material systems um, when we you know when we add maybe a heavy element or maybe we um, we add uh, rare earth um, magnetic elements and 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 sort of understand the the spin orbit torques a little bit better. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is that we're also working on amorphous bismuth telluride and, and crystalline bismuth telluride is a topological insulator. Um, and so it can be used and has been shown to, uh, um, to generate spin currents that can be quite large. And um, we think that we um, might be seeing in our electronic da transport data some sort of similar effects to what's seen in crystalline systems. And, and so we think this, um, this could be an interesting direction that we're really excited about. And finally, um, I just I have to acknowledge, um, first of all, my funding sources from the Australian Research Council um, through Fleet and, and my discovery project, as well as my collaborators. So Francis Hellman and Saif Salahuddin and their groups at um, UC Berkeley, as well as Ruchin Wu and his group at UC Irvine and um, my group here at Monash. So Scott Bennett um, did some of the anomalous Hall effect measurements in the amorphous iron cobalt silicon systems and Gold and Alex are, are working very hard hard at um, measuring the amorphous bismuth telluride work that I that I mentioned um, a few minutes ago. And with that, um, I'm just really want to thank you for um, for calling into to my talk and I'm happy to answer some questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, Ivan had to duck off to do something else. So I'm actually going to do the questions myself. Um, we might not have time to get through all of them yeah but i'll um uh, simon granville who uh is from mcdermott and mm -hmm. hi simon um so uh one question which was just uh i tried to write down the numbers of these slides but it was just a couple of slides back is the sot efficiency also dependent on the quality of the interface between the two layers yes it will be um certainly um that's something that we don't, I, I mean, 
we haven't studied specifically um, what our interfaces look like, and so I can't say more about about that. But but absolutely, it will it will be dependent on on the quality of the interface. Okay. Um, and then another question, which was from Anna Porni. Um, so this was a way back. It was slide number seventeen. If okay. Mm. I can try to go back. This is slide seventeen. Uh, okay. was, yeah. How do you decide the thickness of the FM um, so, and, and the heavy metal layer, sorry? Ah, uh, um, so you, so the, the thicknesses need to be relatively low, but you can, um, there is, I mean, you can vary them a little bit. So in our, in our spin orbit torque experiments, um, we used a thickness of eight nanometers, but we have, um, grown samples that are between sort of um, four and 12 nanometers. And, um, and, and so, and so you, I mean, we, we actually are, we need to do a, a, a thickness series and study the effect of the spin orbit torque on the thickness. And that's something that we're trying to do right now. So um, if you make it too thick, you are in, in, a, when you're considering, I mean, there's a couple different effects that might be going on. So this is kind of a long answer to a short question. Um, if, if you're thinking about the spin hall effect, um, eventually that will saturate out because it's a bulk effect. Um, if, it, if it's a Rashba Edelstein effect, it's an interface effect and it shouldn't really matter what the thickness is um, of, the, of the kind of um, amorphous iron silicon layer or the non-magnetic -mag layer. Um, the ferromagnetic layer, I think if you make it too thick, um, you might lose some of the signal. Um, yeah. Okay. I hope that um, answers the question. I might just have one more question, which is okay. the, the same part. Is there any intuitive way to understand why the intrinsic contribution is larger in amorphous materials? Actually, this, so this was slide 29. If that 29. Um, I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure that I would say it's larger necessarily. Um, I, I guess we haven't, we haven't made a comparison strictly between the intrinsic contribution in amorphous and crystalline, which we would probably have to do using theory. Um, I think, I guess my point is that it, that it's there and it seems to be um, a, a pretty dominant contribution. In, in the amorphous materials, but whether or not then on top of that you have a side jump contribution or something and that's what maybe gives you a larger value um, in total for the amorphous system in comparison to the crystalline is something that we haven't um, specifically investigated through through calculation. So I, I'm not sure that I can I can answer that exactly because I'm not sure that it's um, necessarily larger. Okay. Um, and that might be uh, I'm just thinking people probably have other meetings that they have to go to. So that might be all the questions that we can get to. Um, Simon had a couple of others, which I'll email to you. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Um, and then there were a couple of others, but I don't know who asked them. So. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> hard to follow up. Well, um, thank you again for your talk, yeah. Julia. It was really interesting. Thank you very much. And yeah. See you. See you. And uh, thanks to Australia for co-hosting this with us too. Thanks. Mm -hmm.